So hello, everyone. So awkward Zoom handshake. My name is Kamatara Johnson, and I am the executive director of Circles USA. I happen to be in Albuquerque, New Mexico. And this specific breakout room is to explore the concept of transformational relationships and how that can help your organization to accomplish its mission. But as a home base, I want us to think about two words. And it, my first job was as a high school English teacher for 23 years. And one of the terms that we used in teaching is called a range finder. When you're trying to find like a, a yardstick, a measurement, like how do we tell, is this, you know, is this an A, a B, a C, or a D? Or is this a 10 out of 10? Is this a five out of 10? Is this a one? You're like, we need a range finder. Okay, so our range finder for today is the word transactional. And then the other end of that range finder is transformational. I wasn't able to join via Whova app and had to join via the Zoom link. Oh, okay. So yes, if you're texting with anyone who's struggling, please you know, ask them to click where it says join via Zoom. That would be fantastic. All right, so let's think about transactional versus transformational. And just like we heard, you know, Becca and some of the folks in the panel discussion, let's start with our own experience. Can you think of times where you might have a transactional relationship? And what characterizes a transactional relationship? So you could either just unmute and speak it into the room or you could throw it into the chat. What makes something transactional? Mm, okay, there's give and get. Um, oh, that's an interesting perspective that work could be inherently transactional, like here's the time for money, like I do this, you give me that. Okay, and so work is an example. Can you think of some other things in your life where it's just, yeah, this is transactional? Yeah, every encounter with a customer service department, right? Um, needing to share goods, incentives, work partnerships. You know, I think of like, okay, the tire light is on. I pull up to the Jiffy Lube and I say, hi, my tire light is on. And they say, oh, great. Would you like to stay in the car? Would you like to go into the, yeah, it's just like, we, they do the thing. I get in, get out, get her done. And, and sometimes that could be, completely appropriate. That, that could be absolutely fine that something is transactional. As much as I appreciate the folks who work at my local Jiffy Lube, I, I don't really need a, a close and abiding relationship with them. That's okay. I'm good with that. But when I was a high school English teacher in a massive school that had 19 buildings, and I had anywhere from 150 to 240 students a day. <laughs> that is transactional. No matter how much I wanted it to be transformational, I, mm, glimmers of transformation, yes. But on a whole, we were all in battle mode, like sheer raw survival. It was about the numbers. And like I'm seeing in the chat, you know, how do you connect personally? There is a distance, you know, we're just doing something to get something. It, it's, not, it's not healthy. So transactional can be, it, it can be appropriate, but oftentimes in places where we really don't want it to be transactional, it is. And that's when I tend to check out. As a teacher, I felt helpless and I'm sure the students felt frustrated and also helpless. It was horrible, just to be honest, towards the end. It, I just couldn't do it anymore. So think now about the opposite end of our range finder from transactional to transformational in your own life. When have you had a relationship that was transformational? Can you just, can you think of an example 
of a transformational relationship. So you could either unmute and shout it out into the room, or you could type it in the chat. Either way, whatever your, your comfort level is. Oh, wow. Ellie, that's an amazing example in the chat. Just getting coffee with an angry Uber driver and hearing his perspective and leaving as friends. Oh, transformation when you got married. Oh, that's that's wonderful. I'm glad that wasn't transactional. Blessings, yes. Um, oh, goodness. Just the other night, um, had some ladies over, shared stories, new relationships. Oh, meeting weekly throughout COVID. You know, when I think of transformative or transformational relationships, you know, I think of people who have been great allies or mentors to me, something where there's maybe a long-term relationship. Um, I think, I think of what Becca said in the panel discussion that to have something that's transformational, even, even if that's not the intention, but to have something that's transformational, we have to set aside time and intention. It's not something that just happens on the fly. Well, maybe it does if you're inspired. You never know. But it does take some time. So it's it's interesting to think, what's the difference between transactional and transformational? And when is that appropriate, not appropriate? How do we foster that? And then what does that mean for our organization? So whatever organization you belong to, or if if you're here as a, a community, you know, an individual community member, is there a place where you volunteer or you feel you do your work out in the world to think about that mission? So here's our, our first mini activity that we're going to do in this room. I'm going to ask for each person, if you could share your, how do you pronounce your name? And then if you could share your location, where are you? What's the name of the organization where you are out in the world doing your work? And could you, and this is the ultimate challenge, can you share what you do in a sentence or less? <laughs> so we're gonna do a, a whip through the room. So just to model. So I'm Kamatara Johnson. I'm in Albuquerque, New Mexico. I'm the executive director with Circles USA, which is a national nonprofit working to end poverty. Okay, so take a moment just to think what you're going to say. And if it makes you nervous, just take a moment to write it down. So that way you don't have to be nervous. And then you don't have to be thinking about what you're going to say while other people are talking. You can listen. So we're just going to pause for a minute. And I am gonna invite you one more time. If you are able to turn on your video, it will be much easier for us to interact. I do understand not everyone's um, computers can do that, but if you can, we'd really appreciate it. I'll type into the chat what I'm asking you to say. So it's name, location, do, do, do. Name, location, organization super brief mission. All right. Oh, I see so many more people now. Thank you. That makes me so happy. All right. So, and, and if I don't say, I'm just going to call on people as I see them. And if you want to opt for the chat, you even could just say, you know, I would prefer the chat, but it, I, I would love to be able to hear your voice if, if you feel comfortable with that. So Cindy, will you start us off? Cindy Black, please, if you'll unmute and share. Sure. Um, my name is Cindy Black. I'm the executive director of Fix Democracy First based in Seattle, Washington. 
And um, our organization is a pro-democracy organization that works on reforms and civic outreach to strengthen democracy in Washington state and nationally. Oh, thank you, Cindy. That is fantastic. And then circle six, eight, you've got a whole room. But if you have, do you have one person that could be a spokesperson and just introduce us around? Yes, hello. Um, uh, we are Six Eights, an organization in Sauk Prairie, Wisconsin. Um, and we have 12 of us joining throughout the day. We decided to be in the same room so we could dialogue together. Um, our organization is working to transform communities by making service personal. Um, and so we are excited. We have a Circles chapter um, with Kamatara, but we do a lot of other things as well. And so we are just excited to grow in empathy and learn how to dialogue. Awesome, thank you so much. And Bree, I saw your hand was up. So why don't you go next? Thank you. Hi, my name is Bree Wiesararayano. Uh, my pronouns are they and she, and I am uh, with Girls Inc. of Metro Denver. I work, serve as an advocacy coordinator. Our mission is to inspire all girls to be strong, smart, and bold. Um, and part of my role as an advocacy coordinator means um, running a program for teens to learn advocacy skills, um, connect to community change for their communities, um, and really build on some of those skill sets to have meaningful dialogue and create meaningful changes. They you know, develop into um, strong, smart, and bold adults. Wow, that's fantastic. Thank you, Bree. And is it Stephen or Stefan Buckley? Why don't you go next and help me know how to say your name? Yep, Stephen. Fine, thank you. Uh, yeah, I uh, I'm uh, on Cape Cod, Massachusetts, and I am special representative from the uh, international, the U.S. chapter of the International Association for Public Participation, where I attend um, the White House Interagency Working Group on uh, Open Government, uh, which is all about improving the quality of civic engagement. So check that out at open.usa.gov. Right. It's about citizen experience. So they're all about how do we transform the federal government to improve the experience that people have, the relationship that they mm -hmm. have with the government. So oh, we'll, excellent. Thank you, so Steve. Check it out. Yep. So Sarah, I see you've got your hand up. Will you introduce yourself, please? Hi, good afternoon, good evening, good morning. I am Sarah Beval, a fossil Fanda from Cameroon. And uh, I have uh, an organization, uh, Hope of Africa, where we focus more on women empowerment, empowering women and ensuring and doing advocacy and lobbying that women are, women are represented, are being uh, placed in decision-making uh, spheres, uh, presently, we have an ongoing crisis within our, uh, in our country, in the Southwest and Northwest, where we, I am the general coordinator for uh, mm -hmm. a coalition of women, of grassroots women-led organizations, about 150 grassroots women-led organizations within the Southwest and Northwest regions, where we are into peace building, mediation, as well as uh, we talk about community dialogues. Mm -hmm. In short, we are into peace building where we make sure that we uh, build the capacities of women to be advocates, as well as we, we talk about, we train women on mediation, we train women on uh, dialogues, different kinds of dialogues, strategic dialogue. Now we are into community dialogues because we know that uh, that is the way we could have to, in order to transform the conflict that we already have, we're trying to have a kind of conflict transformation and then we're going towards a post-conflict reconstruction. Oh Thank my gosh, you. that's amazing. Thank you, Sarah. And Linda, I see you have your hand raised, so please introduce yourself. I'm Linda Sorella from Puyallup, Washington, which is about an hour south of Seattle. I am a retired business professor, and um, I currently do coaching and some corporate training on a very small scale. Most of my work is volunteer around facilitation, dialogue, and empathic intelligence. Wow, that's great, Linda. Thank you so much. And Allie, will you introduce yourself, please? 
Absolutely. Hi, everybody. I'm Allie Fisher. I recently moved to Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. I work at a nonprofit called the Foundation for Family and Community Healing based in Virginia. Um, and we are focused on healthy relationships with self, others, earth, and the loving force that connects us. And we do that through online educational modules that are focused on behavior change and positive psychology principles. Mm. Oh, thank you, Ellie. I'm so inspired already. All right, so Susan, um, will you introduce yourself, please? Hi, I'm Susan Washinger. I'm in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. I'm with Pennsylvania Health Access Network, and we are an advocacy organization um, trying to ensure access for affordable health care for all Pennsylvanians. Mm. Wow. All right. Joan, will you introduce yourself, please? Hi, my name is Joan Kuriansky, and uh, I live in Washington, D.C., and uh, am uh, retired as an attorney and uh, advocate on primarily issues of gender justice. And uh, more recently, I serve on the board of a number of organizations, including Circles USA, and work on issues from ending poverty to advocating uh, for peace in the Middle East, um, to addressing issues that relate to um, helping Israel become a more democratic society. Thank you, Joan. I appreciate your presence here. David, will you introduce yourself, please? Sure. Hi, everyone. I'm David Neptune. Um, I'm in Los Angeles. I'm a documentary filmmaker. And I've recently become involved with a project by a man named Scott Weinberg called People Power, where uh, our intention is to bring together uh, people from all walks of life to talk about some of the biggest, most difficult problems in the world and uh, come up with super solutions through a deliberative process. So um, as part of that project, I was encouraged to participate today. And I'm really interested to find out more and I'm passionate about uh, the environment and the climate and how we can uh, help live more in harmony with this planet. So thanks oh, for having me. That's great. Thanks, David. So Nancy, could you introduce yourself, please? Do you see an unmute? No. Okay. Would you? Oh, there it is. We got you. Oh, but I can't hear you. Can other people hear her? No. So Nancy, would you mind typing your introduction into the chat? Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. We appreciate that. All right. So then Tom, will you introduce yourself, please? Yeah, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Tom Steffen. I am a pastor at a church in Thousand Oaks, California. Mm -hmm. Our emphasis is on prayer, compassion, and humility. Mm -hmm. And um, and I also serve on the board of IDEOS. Awesome. Great to have you, Tom. And now do you say Mara? Did I pronounce that correctly? So Mara, will you introduce yourself, please? Sure, my name is Mara Claussen. I'm in Oxnard, California. I'm a former board member of IDEOS, and I have been retired for the last 10 years uh, from high tech and serve uh, as a volunteer with multiple organizations, both on boards and doing day-to-day -day work, uh, primarily Christian ministries, focusing on teaching, discipleship, um, organizations like Compassion International, Christian Foundation of America, Michelle Telfer Ministries, and then two ministries, my husband and I um, have initiated um, of our own, one a global leadership community and the other one, a manual discipleship community, which is in Uganda, where we spend up to half of our time. Ooh, thank you so much. <laughs> All right. And Karen, I know that you typed in the chat, but would you mind speaking it into the room so we can hear your voice? Oh, I don't hear it. Do y'all hear it? Oh, shucks. 
All right, so let me scroll back because I know Karen was wonderful and already typed in the chat. So it said Karen Todd, um, Circles USA in St. George, Utah. Um, I coach our leaders to transform their lives through relationships with their allies and a group as a whole. And hi, Karen, it's very good to see you. Thank you so much, Karen. So now, Caroline, do you say Caroline or Carolyn? It's Caroline. Caroline, will you introduce yourself, please? Thank you. My name is Caroline Blackwell. I live about 55 miles south of Washington, D.C., and I'm vice president in a national education association that serves private independent schools. Mm, that is fantastic. Thank you, Caroline. Lisbeth, will you introduce yourself, please? Yes, sorry. I'm on a phone. Can you hear me? <laughs> yes. okay. uh, my name is Lisbeth Carlson. I'm in Copenhagen, Denmark. Um, I'm a reporter, uh, investigative mm -hmm. reporter. Um, I write for a magazine or a newspaper called POV International. I'm also teaching uh, communication skills across political divides and have done that in the US. Um, I lived in Washington, D.C. for numerous years, mm -hmm. uh, and I will be teaching again uh, during the National Week of Conversation. Oh, wonderful. Thanks, Elizabeth. For Sylvia S., are you able to unmute and speak? It's, it's a little uncertain when I can't quite see people, but Sylvia, can you introduce yourself? And maybe not. I'll just I'll just kind of go through to see some of the folks who aren't sharing their screens because I, I also understand. Oh, yes, I can see you, Sylvia. Oh, no, no. It, Sylvia moved. Wait, Jenny, I can now see you. I got excited. So, Jenny, can you introduce yourself? Certainly. I'm Jenny Gerard from Oakland, California. I'm retired. My encore career was as chief of staff to the council president in Oakland. And what particularly motivates me to be here is the ongoing circumstances in which I find myself in conversation with people who want more than there are resources to mm. provide. So this was certainly my experience in City Hall, and it continues to be the case as I'm involved in a number of uh, local and org national organizations. It's a skill I hope to develop, uh, a, a muscle I hope to develop in a bigger way. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's wonderful. Thank you, Jenny. Um, for I'm just going to open up the floor for anyone else who hasn't introduced themselves. We're hoping to hear your name, your location, your organization, and just like a one sentence or less mission. I'm just going to open the floor because I know some of the folks that aren't sharing their screen, you may or may not be in the room. So I'll just pause for a minute. Okay. Oh, all right, all right. So I tried to catch as many people as humanly possible. I hope that it was fascinating not only to see all the different people in all the different places where people are and all the different missions. And then the thing that might be binding us together here is the interest in relationships, especially transformational relationships, not transactional, transformational. And so I wanna take us to the next step in, the, in the, the thinking here, to think about your own organization and what is your mission and what does that have to do with relationships and relationships with whom? So to just give you an example, um, Circles USA has almost 80 chapters across the United States and up into Canada. And our mission is building community to end poverty. And we have two goals. One is to remove, well, one is to support folks on the journey out of poverty. And then the other is to remove the barriers that keep people in poverty. And we do that primarily through relationships. So there's relationships between individuals, there's relationships of, in the community, there's relationships with partner organizations that are local and even national. So we know that 
It's all about relationships. And especially as we, we bring people together to do the work of ending poverty, we're bringing people together across so many differences, like across income lines, across political lines, across race, color, creed, religion, sexual orientation, expression, like you name it, because everyone's coming together for this common goal. And, and maybe that's what your organization is like too. There's this common goal that inspires people to, to come together across difference. And we know that in this intentional space, that's where we can foster the transformation of individuals, of families, of communities. And then we have some ground to stand on. We can create a system and a community where everyone can have enough money, meaning, and friends to thrive. So the purpose of this breakout session is not only to have this experience that we are having right now, um, but also to really consider how relationships can help your organization to accomplish its mission. And then could you create some action steps or a goal for yourself or something you're going to do next to foster those relationships? Like what might help? So we are going to do our next little mini experiential where we are going to do what we call in, in circles land, we call a, a listening pair. And that's where I'm gonna ask you a question and I will type it in the chat as well. And then I'm going to get you in a breakout room with one other person. So that way you can listen to each other and whatever the question is, person A, you will get about three minutes to share your answer and person B, your only job is to listen. And then when it's time to switch, I'll have the timer going. So you can just look at your time. And when it's time to switch, then person B, you get to share your answer and person A, you get to listen. And if for some reason you really end up having extra time and you wanna dialogue, that could be fine. But the goal here is to really practice speaking and to practice listening. So we call it a listening pair. And, and thank you, Sylvia, for chiming in on the, the chat. I was wondering if that was you, precious Sylvia and Escondido, and thank you so much for being here. So I'm going to set up the breakout rooms and, oh, Elizabeth, you have a question. Yes. Yeah, just a quick one. When you said practicing listening, so I gather it's not just being quiet, silent. I mean, we're talking about a dialogue or how do you envision this um, um, the three minutes. Right. When I'm listening, I think it's the active listening where I'm yeah, listening yeah, yeah. Person, <laughs> I'm nodding, I'm following. <laughs> and one of the big goals is to not interrupt or sometimes I'll just use an I statement. Sometimes I will interrupt or sometimes I will daisy chain a conversation. And then it all of a sudden goes down a different rabbit hole as opposed to where maybe this person would have taken it if if he or she had just naturally been allowed to say their own thing. So it's just a, a suggestion of how it might go. And then Sarah, would you like to add as well? Uh, I just wanted to say that it's, uh, I think the, 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 the talking and listening, it's a very good uh, 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 idea because I, if I take Cameroon, we have been talking, we have been talking, but nobody's listening. Mm. So uh, both warring parties are talking, but none is listening. So I think a listening is a very important aspect in dialogue because when you listen, you you it helps you to develop the empathy, and then you can easily put yourself in the other person's shoes in order to understand where the other person is coming from. So it will also help to for the conversation or the dialogue to flow. I think that's a, that's a very that's an important aspect in, in dialogue. Thank you. Excellent. So now what I'm going to ask you to do is I am going to put folks into um, into breakout rooms, and then I also want to give you a little option. So so six eight. Just don't join the breakout room because you've got 12 people in your room. Y'all can do your own thing. If you end up in a breakout room and after, let's say, a minute or two, nobody's coming, 
just exit the breakout room, come back into the main room. Because right now it says we've got X amount of participants, but you know, we have to be a little, little creative with how Zoom works. Okay, so I'm gonna put people into may, the breakout room. May I interrupt for just a moment? Oh, please, Nancy, yes. Yeah, uh, well, I got my uh, audio by, uh, I left the meeting. Yes. And then I reconnected with the meeting, but now I'm doing it on Zoom. Yes. Instead of Wova. So I know there was another person in our group that we couldn't hear that person's audio. Oh, maybe, thank you. Maybe they that. could try that same technique. Oh, you guys are so good supporting each other. Thank you. All right. So the question on the table is, and I'll type it into the chat too in just, just a moment. How does your mission depend upon relationships and with whom? How does your mission depend upon relationships and with who? So you'll have six minutes, split it three and three. And if, if for some reason no one shows up in your room after a bit, come on back to me, okay? All right, here we go. Okay, welcome back everyone. I hope that you had a fantastic listening pair with your partner. So if you wanna take a moment of very awkward Zoom eye contact to have a moment of reverence for your partner. Let's just send each other a little love. Thank you. Thank you. And for the, the people at 6-8, just reverence for your partner. Appreciate that. All right. Thank you so much. So I hope you had some time to consider, you know, here's your mission and here's relationships. And, you know, how do we get these two things to come together because I know for Circles USA, we have local relationships and we have national relationships. So for our model, you know, we function locally because we have, you know, almost 80 chapters across the United States and up into Canada. So each chapter locally, like in Wisconsin, in Utah, we have a couple people in the room here, it's like you have your own relationships with the beautiful people in your own community. And in these relationships, we're going to build them up over time. And one of the key aspects of these relationships in circles is that, yes, people are meeting across difference for the common goal of ending poverty, but we're, we try to level the playing field. Or a new phrase that some folks really love is we're trying to center the margins. So how, how do we bring people together and amplify the voices who are typically unheard or the people who are typically unseen? And so we're trying to bring that together because in circles, our primary participant, um, they're the folks with the lived experience of poverty. They are the center of our circle. In fact, we even call them circle leaders because they are the expert of their lived experience and their journey and what's best for them. They are the protagonist of their journey. And we're not here to rescue, fix, save all the toxic charity, unhelpful things that, that might happen. Instead, you know, we're fostering intentional friendships relationships. So we're, we're agreeing to share the journey and we're agreeing to share our hearts and our minds and what we know and who we know while we share the journey towards economic mobility, while we're sharing the journey towards building our community and transforming our lives and, and everyone's lives are transformed, not just the circle leaders who may have the lived experience of poverty, our allies, the people who agree to share that 18 month journey, their lives are transformed. The staff members' lives are transformed. Our research team members, like ev everyone who is in this is transformed. And it's probably like that in your organization too, that everyone who is touched by your organization in some way has a transformational experience. So how do we support those relationships to support the transformation? And so one of the ways that we do that is through training. And, and I'm actually thinking about what Sarah was saying earlier. There's a lot of people talking, but not a lot of people listening. Okay, we need the space for that, but we also need the training for that. And I know that's part of what IDEOS does also with the empathetic 
um, intelligence training, the generative dialogue training. It's also, you know, Circles USA has a lot of training for the participants, for the volunteers, for the staff. And it's not just to learn about the model, it's to learn about ourselves because we do bring all of ourselves to work whatever we're doing, whether we want to or not, because we are whole, complete, amazing, awesome people. Like, how could we not? So it's really important for me to learn about myself that I, for example, tend to be a big talker. That's probably why I became a school teacher and now I'm a minister and now I'm an executive director. Okay, I need to know that about myself. So what can I do to be a better listener? Or for my amazing spousal unit, my beautiful husband, he is incredibly introverted. So what can he do to, to speak more? And how can I make the space for him to speak more, for me to listen more? That's been essential for our marriage. So it doesn't matter the context. This stuff just works. It's, it's good stuff wherever you have relationships. And so with the training, okay, I can practice. I, I can get to know myself. I can do the inner work that supports the outer work that I want to do. So we're aligning our minds, our hearts, our hands to have healthy relationships with ourselves and with others. So what is that obstacle to the healthy relationships that could be happening? Well, in, in our organization, because we're an anti-poverty organization, we know there's a lot of shame, blame, stigma, um, myths, stereotypes about people who are experiencing poverty. Just the phrase, poor people. Oh, I don't know anybody who's poor, but I, know, I do know people who are experiencing poverty. So even just shifting the language that we use to put people first could be could be a game changer. So that training and removing the shame and stigma. And then for, for me, you know, when I was a person who was experiencing poverty, I, I had you know, worthiness issues and deserving issues and all sorts like I, I must be a bad person and I'm doing something wrong and it's me. And to unplug from that in a safe place to say, I am worthy, I am good, I do deserve, I am an equal partner, I do have a voice, I am seen, I am heard, I am valued, that takes training and practice. And that's where the healing begins and that's where healthy relationships begin. And then also for our allies and volunteers and staff members to have training to say, oh, there's an experience here that I may not understand. I'm open to learning. I'm open to not judging. I'm willing to listen, to learn, to cheer people on, to love first, to show up as love and to give people the benefit of the doubt. That takes training and it takes practice and to have the safe place to make mistakes and to step in it. And, you know, we have a beautiful thing in circles, another community building tool we call oops, ouch, and oh. So if I do step in it and say something that hurts someone's feelings, they can say, ouch, and we can stop. And I can say, oh, wow. oh, I'm sorry. Could, please help me understand because I want to learn. And, and then we have a moment and I get to listen and hear and understand. And I can give a very sincere, oh, oops. I, okay, I, I understand that now. Thank you. So we have different safety features in place while we're having our relationships. So we have, in addition to training, those community building protocols. So think about your own organization. What protocols or processes or what do you already have in place that help your relationships? So we have things like New and goods, we ask each person to share one thing that is both new and good at the start of every meeting. Or you'll notice when we came into this meeting right away, every single person, let's hear your name. Let's see your face. I wanna hear your voice because people who are heard feel seen. So just say with that one more time, people who are heard feel seen. So it's really important to give time for that. It took time 
It really did. It took time for us to listen and see every single person. But I personally feel like it was it was worth every minute that it took, every beautiful face, every mute, unmute problem that we had. It was it was worth it. Every person is worth the effort. So think about what community building protocols or relationship development tools, whatever you want to call it, what do you have? And then do you have different tiers of relationships? Because we have our local relationships and we have national relationships because we happen to be a national organization with chapters all across. So how do we put how do we put those relationships together, even though we may be in totally different places? So we're going to do another listening pair. And this time you're going to be with different people. And here's the question that I want you to think about. How does your organization, I just gave you a whole bunch of examples for our organization. How does your organization support or foster your mission essential relationships? Okay, so how does your organization support or develop your mission essential relationships? Okay, so I'm going to open up the breakout rooms and think about your answer while it takes me a minute here. And let's see here. I'm going to assign the rooms. And then we'll do the same thing, like circle six, eight, you just stay in your room because you all got each other. And then I'm going to see if there's a room with no one in it. You know, I'm going to switch you around. We'll get everyone connected. And I'll type the question in. I'll broadcast the question in just a minute. So how does your organization support your mission essential relationships? Come back. Thank you so much for being with your partner. Appreciate all that you shared. All right, so moment of fabulously awkward Zoom eye contact. Thank you so much to our partners. All right, and to the people in the room, thank you, thank you. Hopefully you got to meet someone new and expand your, your understanding of each other. Maybe you got some great ideas. What I would love for you to do is if you could pop open the chat and just share what are some things, it, I know it's relationships are complex, so it might be hard to say in a, a sentence, but as brief as possible, <laughs> could, could you share? Do you have a, a tool, a technique, a thing you do to foster relationships? If you do wanna unmute and speak it into the room, we could take a couple of those. And then if you wanna just type into the chat, what? What do you do to foster your mission essential relationships? Oh, show up, A number one, show up. All right. And Sarah, let's hear a bit from you today. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. What we do since we work with grassroots women, what we do to foster relationship is we try to go out of, think out of the box. We do things that are a little bit not very, common but very common with women which is like uh beauty we have a uh, makeup in we have cookout sessions where we organize that uh, something like uh women we have different uh traditional uh, dishes and then we put women in groups and then uh to cook because it's another way of building a, a way of uh negotiation because each woman has her own unique recipe and mm -hmm. if you put five women together to cook one one dish they, they have to agree you know they have to come together and agree you know so we use all that to foster a relationship when it comes with the government what we do is sometimes we organize talks town hall talks and then we invite them now we we are not uh, we don't look at them as uh, we don't try to always condemn the act, but we try to encourage them in some of the, the things that they have done well. And then we, in another way, we say, okay, you have done this well, but we think that as women, if it was done this way, it would be more inclusive 
in mm -hmm. including us. So the women, the, the government, because they are all policy makers, because we need them to, to make policies that will be favorable to the, the women. So we make them know that we are just complementing their efforts, their work, and we are not competing with them. So we are complementing them. Yes. So, so they feel more uh, like, did you hear what the women said? You know, you know, and they'll always brandish those things that will, will talk, talk to them. But then we we'll have to still we use that as an entry point to keep the relationship going, to maintain it so that they feel that we need them as much as they need us. Mm -hmm. So that is what we, the little things that we do. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Sarah. And I do feel like talk about bringing people together across difference, making food. How do you make this thing? I mean, that could be woo, an intense dialogue. I know when I was a, a young newlywed, my husband and I had some come to Jesus meetings about how to make different foods. And I was like, no, it has to be this way. No, it has to be this way. And then we have our, our new hybrid way of doing that thing. And I'm seeing in the chat just some beautiful suggestions. It really, breaking bread together, food is, is just really intimate, but also it's relaxed. It's a safe space where, you know, how are we getting people to just eat and talk and then finding things that are in common, um, recognizing the oh the recognizing the contributions of each volunteer and and the participants and in everyone in circles we have a tradition called appreciations so at the end of every night we're in a circle and then it goes around the circle and we appreciate each person it goes around like a little daisy chain and so for people you know again being seen heard appreciated valued it flips the narrative that's inside and then it's safe and oh I mean it's just it's that aggregate phenomenon. Like how does it build up to create relationships over time? Oh, Tom, I love that. Go to where people are instead of expecting them to come to our organization. And we do have some chapters that are very neighborhood based. And it's all about the local assets and the local people and, and having, you know, what's pl it's place-based which is wonderful because then people really are on their home turf and feel comfortable and that's so beautiful. So also when I was, I was a, a Girl Scout leader of a bilingual troop. So in Espanol y en inglés, it was muy divertido. We had such a good time. And one of the biggest goals, in fact, I think the, the only goal we had was that every single girl was gonna have a moment to be seen and heard each time we met. And it was the most powerful thing ever because especially in the culture in which we were working in this particular school, most of the, the little girls were basically told to be seen and not heard. And they were being groomed to be baby makers as opposed to being leaders. And so our biggest goal was for every single girl to have a voice and to be seen, heard, and valued, and to see the growth of those beautiful babies from the time they were in kindergarten in daisies to the time that they got to be juniors and Girl Scouts when you're, you know, in fifth, sixth grade. It was wild to see that difference. So maybe think of some of your participants who have just blossomed with the beautiful things that you do to foster relationships. You probably have your own amazing victory stories as well. I know for that, for our circle leaders, so the people with the lived experience of poverty, to have that experience of, of being valued, of being seen and heard, and I am worthy and I could be a leader in my community. Wait, what? And people might listen to me or my experience in poverty is valuable because I understand how the system is broken. Oh, wow, I could speak to policymakers? People might listen. It's huge. It's a game changer. And then it transfers to every arena of my life where I have a, a sense of autonomy. I don't have to give empowerment to anyone, but could I recognize my own inherent empowerment because I am a human being and I have this power because I exist and I am here. Wow, that's such a game changer. And then to practice it. I, I'm sure all of your organizations are 
in that arena as well. So that's that's super exciting work. Okay, so we have time for one more breakout room. And this is where we need to think, how might we be able to improve our relationships? Is there a hang up? Is there a disconnect? Is there somewhere where the message isn't going through? Is there a place where things feel like silos? And you know, left hand, this is your right hand. We aren't even talking to each other. What is it? Is, the, is there a kink in the hose somewhere? And, and I can give you a simple example. When I first got to Circles, we had you know maybe 60, 70 chapters, 60 some chapters across the United States and Canada. And it was kind of like a loosely knit kind of, it was a network. Okay, there's a network of people. And what was so wonderful was to try to think, how do we get these silos to get connected? How do we shift from a network to a community of practice? Like, how do we drop down and in? Like, we're not just in our heads or we're sort of aware of each other. How do we drop into that heart space where we are connected and we care for each other and we are in it to win it for each other? And that really happened with Circles USA as a national organization. Our local chapters love each other and take care of each other. And we, we just made opportunity after opportunity on a regular basis for them to connect with each other, whether it's an in-person conference or monthly webinars, or we have support calls for each role. Like here's the coach's support call. Here's the children's program support call. Here's the coordinate. You know, we try to set up way, all different ways for people to connect and it dropped down and in, and it improved our relationships. So I'm gonna get you into one more breakout room. And while I'm trying to set up the breakout rooms, just think, is there any place where maybe the relationships aren't as strong as they could be? Because if you can put your finger on it, maybe you might be able to think of a solution too. So, so is there just one area where your organization could improve its relationships. Let me open up the breakout rooms. Okay. And let me shift. All right, almost ready. So you're thinking about your answers. Okay. And I'll do my best to get you into a room with a person really in it and I'll swish you around if it looks like they're not there. Okay. So our last listening pair. And the question is, is there one area for improvement for your organization where it comes to relationships? Welcome back, Nancy. Yeah, I was in a chat room with uh, Cassandra, and mm -hmm. she said she had a very low band connection. Oh, and so sometimes she could hear me, and sometimes she couldn't. And a video was impossible. Here she comes. A video was impossible. So we just. Yeah. Did the best. I wish these chat sessions we were did. a little longer. Yes. <laughs> Always. And, and that's actually one of the things we laugh about in circles when we do listening pairs. If you give people, you know, six minutes in a room, it's too short. You could give people 10 minutes, it's too short. You could give people like an hour. They're like, it's too short. I'm like, I know, we want to talk to each other. It's like the grocery store at the, it's like the, the cart at the grocery store, like however big it is, I'm going to fill it. Yeah. So it, yeah, it's it's tricky. I was hoping that y'all would meet a whole bunch of people. Well, with three minutes, there's no time for foreplay. No, you you're right. You have to cut, just cut to the chase, which is good for people like me who say way too much. And for the people who don't say enough, three minutes could feel like a century, you know? Well, yeah, you know, you are chatty, but the thing is, the things that you say are valuable. Oh, I hope so. So I think, you know, it's it's just finding the balance right yeah, you're not wasting our time good deal welcome back welcome back 
I hope you had a beautiful listening session with your partner. Maybe y'all found some good ideas or some common ground. So, so moment of reverence for your partner. I love you with my eyes. All right. I love Zoom. It's so awkward. All right. So it's also very humbling. I'm just saying every, every day on Zoom is, is humbling. So do you have any ideas about what you might do for that one area where you might improve your relationships? Could you type it in the chat or do you feel courageous and you might speak something into the room? Oh, Stephen, you're on it. The hand is up. Let's hear it. Uh, yes, I was talking with Mara and we were talking about um, Uganda and so forth, the different cultures and the idea is that you can have a different culture in your own town. You know, your organization has a different culture. People grow up, their life experience, that to them is the norm. Mm -hmm. And everybody else is like, why are they different? So we all have the subjectivity that ours is the right way. And if everyone, only everybody could change to our way of thinking. So I guess basically if there was a way to have like an empathy test to be able to stop and say, you know, reword. So to be able to appreciate the fact that somebody else was brought up in a different culture than you or and how can you appreciate it without it you know being good a good bad thing and uh yeah. active listening uh repeating or not just repeating but showing that you are actually understanding that their um different perspective oh i love that thank you Stephen, so much and oh you know so many of our chapters bring people together across all different cultures. So understanding the different dynamics of what communication looks like for different cultures is incredibly important to building positive, healthy relationships. So that's fantastic. So other ideas you might share, do you have some ideas about how to improve relationships in your organization? All right. I think we're we're starting to fade. It's the it's the after after lunch coma. It's all good. We I've been giving you a workout. And I also know that you know folks got into this room and they maybe wanted to just kind of watch and not actively participate. So I think people kind of ran screaming, which is fine. I'm so glad we settled down on this really solid, awesome group that was in it to win it. And thank you for participating. I know you know, may not have been what you were expecting, but it's so meaningful to be able to see you and hear you and, and just think for a moment about what we did in this breakout session, because it was functioning. I don't know if you noticed it was functioning on two levels. I was hoping that you would experience the thing that we were talking about. Or whatever it is that you do, remember that there's, there's process and there's content you know, the, the process is how are we doing this thing? We got to hear and see each person. You did breakout sessions and a listening pair. You came back in, we used the chat. That's the process. And then the content was whatever question got asked. And in this case, I mean, it's great that y'all shared content, but the process is the experience. Do you feel like you maybe made some relationships here today? Do you, do you feel positive about what you experienced in this time together? Did you feel seen and heard? And maybe you caught a few ideas that you might be able to just, you know, grab it, transform it, put it into your own organization. That would be fantastic. So, um, it, this really did function on the two levels. I was hoping you would experience transformative relationships as much as we would be talking about them and then sharing ideas. And just to do a quick grab from the chat, 
Um, thank you, Tom. Uh, creating a transactional email by simply adding a real question of inquiry for the people you're reaching out to. <gasps> oh my gosh, transformational email. Okay, mind blown. Because <laughs> it feels so not. Emails tend to feel really transactional. Okay, I'm going to hold on to that little chestnut. Thank you. And then I enjoyed hearing what others had to share to develop a relationship. Yes, it would be great to have even more back and forth. Absolutely, which is one of the next steps as you think about your own organization. In fact, we've just got a couple minutes left for closure to think about it. how do we get healthy relationships that aren't rescuing, fixing, saving. So we have that even playing field. We have a safe place. We have something that's intentional. It is regular because then we have time not only to listen, we can practice listening, we can practice speaking, but then we can get to the next step where we practice dialoguing. And it's that generative dialogue. In fact, IDEOS Institute has specific tools for generative dialogue. So, oh, I should have thought to do that, Stephen. That's a great idea, a poll to ask. How heard did you feel? That, that I love that. That's a great idea. I will know to do that next time. So really, I hope that you'll think of even just one action step that you might take. In fact, Tom modeled a great action step in the chat. Is there one action step you might take to, have, to foster stronger relationships in your organization? So what's, what's your next step? Your, your now what? We always talk about the now what in circles. Okay, I know this, now what? So, so take a moment to throw in the chat or if you wanna unmute and speak it into the room or anything else that you feel you'd like to, to share into the room at this moment, feel free to unmute or type. Oh, refer to introductory calls with potential clients as, oh, collaboration sessions. Oh, I love that. Just even reframing the purpose of, of you interacting action steps. So more check-ins with colleagues. Oh, and without a precise agenda, leaving space for, for everyone to collaborate and share. Oh, those are some good action steps. Well, again, I want to offer my appreciation for y'all sticking around, for you participating and supporting each other, for you showing up and interacting with each other, because that is how relationships happen. And yes, staying engaged. Thank you, Tom, with, with national dialogues, local dialogues. I love it. So any other comments that anyone wants to share out, you can unmute or you could type. This is your moment. Oh, I love Steve Buckley again. I had yeah. just comment. I like Whova because they have polls. And I think the way mm -hmm. that's the feedback, the objective feedback that conveners need to have. Okay. Because we're all subjective, you know. Oh, you look, you know, we always think we did above average job, but mm -hmm. that's the reality. Like, what are the people like Girl Scout troop leader? You were saying, what do the girls think about you? Not mm -hmm. you know, so so ideas that evidence-based. Yes. Feedback to show what's working and what's not working is really good. So it, someday it'll be normal to ask to have a poll. You know. Yes. And today was also a, a bit of a struggle with technology for for a lot of folks, especially folks that were new in in Huba, which included a lot of the speakers. So I absolutely thank you so much for that that feedback. I will definitely level up before my next. Kuva interaction. <laughs> yes. All right. Well, I just want to send all of you appreciation and give you a moment of reverence for your organization and the work you're doing in the world and the intentional relationships that you are fostering. Thank you so much for all that you're doing. Take good care.